again, everyone. It's time to do a thing that I haven't done in almost a year and a half. Just under a year and a half, actually. I haven't gone to a movie in a theater and talked about it. I mean, I've seen movies. I have watched movies on DVD and Blu-ray and streaming and that sort of thing, but not a, you know, a, in, in theater thing with people. Crazy, I know. So, I saw Black Widow. Um, quick disclaimers for this video going up front. Um, Black Widow is set following the events of Captain America Civil War and before the events of Infinity War. And it is difficult to discuss this certain parts of this film without getting into, well, without getting into spoilers for Adventures Endgame. I'm going to refrain to the best of my ability for spoilers from this film, but Avengers Endgame, and long story short, where this film is in the Marvel MCU continuity, no tap dancing around this one. It, it you got to talk about where it is, or where it is, and the fact that it's set before films which have come later with that character. So, if you haven't seen Endgame or anything like that, uh, Civil War, I, I will talk about spoilers here. Well, yeah. Before I get too far into this, I do want to talk a little bit about my movie-going experience. Um, Oregon has hit 70% vaccination rate, so we are full, we are wide open at the moment. Um, so, what is that? So, this film had a fair number of people seeing it in the theaters. Um, not everyone seeing it in the theater were masked. Um, I My general thing was, if I was sitting at my spot looking forward, I was particularly if I was drinking my beverage, I was unmasked. Um, and I had six feet distance between me and the seats next to me, but not everyone had that. Um, from the looks of things as far as for seating and that sort of thing, it looked like most people, when they were making their seat purchases, um, were doing, were, were like deliberately trying to buy seats a couple spots apart from the people next to them. So that's, uh, that's, that, that's reasonable. Um, you know, it's also just thing. Um, funny little thing, which, which I'll say the thing that stuck in my mind is most people showed up at the movie, like much closer to when this movie actually started. Um, not many people in the theater for the whole, um, new V Maria Menudo's thing. I was seeing this at, at the Regal, at a Regal Cinemas. And, like, I got there half hour early, because back in the before times, if you're going to go buy popcorn or a soda or whatever from the concession stand before you go to, to take your seat for your movie, you usually need to wait. Like, look at the theater I was going to. You usually need to give yourself about 20 to 30 minutes before the start of the film, because there's going to be a line. Even if it's something pretty quick, like a soda or some popcorn... You probably want to give yourself some time because it could be a bunch of people in front of you, and some of them may have more complicated orders. Um, pizza, wine, beer, because this this theater in question has those. Um and so I'm like, okay. Give myself a, I'm gonna give myself appropriate time because I figure I'll at least get a soda. Um and so I got there about half hour early. And nobody was there yet. Okay, I went and got my, like, I went, used the restroom before the theater, got my soda, and went back to get my soda, and still nobody there. And then went to the theater, nobody was there yet, and, like, again, about, as I reported, at the very end of the newbie thing, when you're start like, 
right before, like, before the trailers start, like tail end of the movie when you're getting like those last few things and the buy your so and go buy your concessions and the lad and the M and M's thing and the turn off your cell phone thing like that little chunk that is when everyone just started boom, rolling into the theater. Um, some of them still had like snacks and concessions and that sort of thing, but uh, yeah, the, people cutting it a little closer than they did back in the day. Back in the before times. So, that. Um, as far as the rest of the film, um, this was a very solid film. It does have the baggage coming into it of... We've had about ten years of Black Widow, of Scarlett Johansson in the MCU, but not in her own movie like every like every other member of the avengers to some degree or another has had their own film even if it's like a universal co-produced thing for the incredible hulk and there are reasons for this like this was like there are plans and productions for this in like within the mcu in the works for like around 2014 so this film has been almost seven years in the making and Again, there are reasons for this, and they're not good ones. They're based in institutional misogyny. They're based in um, stereotypes that are in turn based on is on prejudice, on false prejudice that people that people won't go to see superhero movie, female-led superhero movies when based on the evidence of Catwoman and earlier Supergirl film. They claim they won't go see female-led action movies um, based on dubious evidence and or dubious arguments. And on top of all, all of this, also you have Ike Perlmutter who, for, who used to be more heavily in charge with charge of Marvel basically being a misogynist uh, on top of his, his other faults. So all of that kept this, like, there has been long documented the barriers and hurdles and obstacles this movie had to overcome to exist. Which, long story short, too late, this film, with this plot, would have been better suited had it actually come out around the time it's set. Or even if this came out between Infinity War and Endgame. Because like we know where Natasha is going to end up. We do. We know she's going to be around for Infinity War, and she knows we know she's going to ultimately die during the events of Endgame. And in a way, this also undercuts things and for a certain degree of the tension for the character of Elena, who is... Long story short, again, um, like the implication that's placed in all of the tra trailers and material leading into the film is that Yelena is going that the, the torch is going to be passed to Yelena, and I don't think there'd necessarily be that sense of that if we didn't know going in that the character of Black Widow is dead and any films. After, set after Endgame, he's dead. Like we didn't have a way, we didn't have them figure out a way to bring her back after Steve Rogers returned the Infinity Stones at the end of Endgame. We didn't have the big reveal of oh, by the way, Natasha's back 
because it's a soul for a soul, or a soul for the soul gem. Um, and with the soul and souls over certain, there's no refunds on that regard. So that's yeah. It it recontexts this film into what again either of those two two other points at either in in between the two halves of the Infinity Saga or after Civil War, if we can contextualize this inherently into a torch passing scene. And I mean it it in that context it's executed well. Um the question in a lot of respects is where do they go with this go like with the character of Elena going forward? Along with other developments related to the Black Widow program. But otherwise it, it works it works well. Um The narrative is kind of it it, it is one of the it is if you were to tell me, okay, what without seeing any trailer so forth going in. If you were to if you were to pitch me a Black Widow movie for the MCU, probably the two concepts you'd come to mind is Natasha squaring the red in her ledger and Natasha smashing the Black Widow program related to point number one. So it it is it I'm not gonna say it's the obvious concept, but it is like the most inherently logical one to 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 go with. We've got enough hooks and hints in earlier films and television series and so forth, well, mainly the films, about the Black Widow program. I mean, even like with, to a certain degree, with the, the first season of Agent Carter, uh, even if that's not completely considered canon, um, it's considered enough of a thing like, okay, the audience can generally put two and two together about the Black Widow program and what that's about. And what Natasha went through, we get a little more in depth for her experiences in particular through an opening montage. But again, it's as far as like am I open montage? I mean, like over the credits. And but we don't get much more in depth than that because we've got enough as it is. We don't. This isn't the main origin story of Black Widow. We get a little bit of the of notes on the uh, on what happened in Budapest. Although even then, it's like a little bit of a tonal thematic shift from the way Budapest was discussed in the Avengers, as far as whatever it was in Budapest that happened with Natasha and Hawkeye. So, other than that, like, it's, as far as, like, the type of film, because the MCU movies have jumped all over, not jumped, but the MCU movies have done a very good job of taking the concept of the superhero film and overlaying it on another genre of movie. Um, as a classic example, Captain America and the Winter Soldier being a 70s conspiracy thriller uh, like the Parallax Factor, Parallax Factor, um, is the Parallax something or other, or better example, Three Days of the Condor, overlaid on the concept of a superhero film. And similar sort of thing here. This is actually, like, Black Widow gets much more of a Bond movie plot in terms of, like, not necessarily the sense of humor. This is, like, there, like, I'd, um, like there's humor, and comedic moments, but there's a, but it's, in some respects, it's more, like, the humor level is a little more Daniel, is like, Daniel Craig with a bit more comedy, or Timothy Dalton, Timothy Dalton, like, more Timothy Dalton, like, like, a little bit, uh, Living Daylights, a little bit, like a little bit of both Living Daylights and uh, License to Kill. Um, but it also, like, this is a comic book superhero 
take on the James Bond movie. So we're also kind of going a bit into Roger Moore territory. And it does do a little bit of a fun job of foreshadowing this with a, a bit earlier in the film, the character watching Moonraker, which I mean like that. And, um, and uh, the spy who loved me are probably like the two Roger Moore movies where you'd go, which aspire to be more agents of shield, 1970s, um, comics kind of thing. And there's certainly a little bit of that here, but again, it is more grounded and serious because the other part of the plot, the thematic, like the heavy thematic weight of the plot is very much Black Widow smashes the pa smashing the patriarchy, similarly to as it was in Captain Marvel. Um, it's actually less subtle about it than Captain Marvel was. Not in the sense of, oh, um, like we don't have Black Widow going Super Saiyan to the same way that uh, Carol Danvers did in Captain Marvel, but like it is, it, it is Natasha going and smashing the Black Widow program, a program that re that as depicted within the comics. So this isn't a new thing. This is something they made up for the movie. It treats women like objects and it turns them into weapons and unleashes them on the world at the command of an organization that is normal that is nominally run by men and ultimately treats the women as expendable and disposable um and like yeah, that's that's not a new development for the movie that's something that goes all the way back to the comics and most depictions of the black widow program um as in the program that natasha left and so it and so it's taking that to the logical conclusion that you'd go with if you're doing a Natasha breaks out the takes down the Black Widow program story, which is I'm trying to save these people who are being victimized by a nasty, horrible system um, perpetuated by men who do not respect their not respect these women's autonomy, physical psychological the gamut and it's handled well it helps that we have a really solid director on this and uh, solid screenwriting on this film in the hands of a like I mean to put this in the way is One of the previous directors who had been considered for this film um, had been, well, <laughs> uh, director Neil Marshall, um, who directed the, speaking of getting back to David Harbour, directed the 29 version of Hellboy, um, which if you had reservations, like, that is a movie where if you saw this, the premise of this film went, oh God, David Harbour in a superhero movie. I watched Hellboy. I don't know if I want to get burned again. Good news. David Harbour does a really good performance in this film, much better than he did in Hellboy. And that's because we have a solid direction from Katie, from Kate Shorthand and a solid screen and good screenplay um, from Jack Schaefer, Ned Benson, and Eric Pearson. So, like that, it's got the source, got the material in it to make it work. Otherwise, um, like again, I don't have a lot of criticism of this film. Like the fight choreography is well done. It it channels some of the chaos of the how the editing is done for the Bourne movies, but it doesn't do the full Bourne shaky cam. It it maintains a sense of geography, pacing, and lets the audience see what these characters are doing. Because that's the problem with the early Bourne with the Bourne films is the core is the camera work for the Bourne films is too busy trying to make oh make everything chaotic and shaking the camera and that sort of thing. And Consequently, undercuts the work that, you know, the actors and the stunt people have done to make the fight scenes 
good and interesting. So, it, 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 there, it does the happy medium very well. I liked this film a great deal. Um, as far as where I'd put it in the my ranking of the MCU, the number of films in the MCU, I will say, has gotten big enough uh, that it's tricky to like rank like it's actually got tricky to rank movies now uh in the MCU in a lot of respects it's a good i would say it's a good start to phase 4 is what i will say it does the important thing for whatever the first film in a marvel phase is going to do or has to do which is to set up what we're trying to do. What's what was coming out of this phase? What what are we building to? And for the last two series that were part of phase four, one division and Falcon of the Winter Soldier, it is a degree of recovery and rebuilding. It is the world has been changed and our Avengers lineup has changed. And where do we go from here? It's WandaVision cope. WandaVision is Wanda coping with the death of Vision. Falcon and the Winter Soldier is the legacy of Captain America and the Super Soldier program and Falcon coming to terms with wielding the shield. Black Widow, while again, while it is set both back in phase three, like technically very early in phase three. The ultimate outcome, I guess, or ultimate goal of this is to be said, again, does torch passing. It's Scott Johansson, after 10 years of being the face of action film, of women, of women in action movies, of not just women-led superhero films, but women in action movies in a lot of respect. Uh, while certainly plenty of women out there who have been doing action movies, um, Gal Gadot, uh, I could... Um, like I'm having a brain fart at the moment in terms of just names. Um, like women have been doing action. Long story short, um, probably Theron. Long story short, women have been doing ac leading action movies for years in the United States, not just the United States and, and Britain, but also in Chinese cinema, particularly cinema from Hong Kong. Um. Z for a good example. There's a trailer for a movie starring Mike Q that's coming up soon, uh, which is a, as which is basically female John Wick, and it looks fantastic. And I'm like I didn't know this movie was coming, and now that I know about it, I'm adding it to my watch list as far as for films that I want to go see in theaters. Now that now that I can do that now. So, but like I have no doubt that Scott Johansson is going to end up doing act, is going to do action movies following her time with the Marvel films, but I don't know how much more she'll be doing in the MCU going forward. And if this is her last hurrah, it's a good enough note going forward, and it kind of. Symbolically, I would say, it was a representative to said of that of what some of the things that Scarlett Johansson Scarjo has done in terms of for mainstream audiences of, of getting audiences willing to buy into the idea of women in leading roles in action films again, and. I hope that this is that that the work that came out of this that again that we're getting that we've gotten Halle Berry in the John Wick movies again uh, doing action films in the John Wick movies again um we have Emily Blunt doing some action stuff as a competent action character as opposed um in the Jungle Cruise movie um, I mean, Kira Knightley did some great action work in the 
Pirates of the Caribbean films, but like, and not that you but like she did solid stuff. She, Scarlett, um, I'd say Kira Knightley is one of the is Scarlett Johansson's predecessor in this regard because she did her fair share of swashbuckling. And and I hope we like we get more like we continue to get more fem more women leading action after this. Uh, like the only thing like I would want like I think the next hurdle that we'd let I think needs to be jumped in terms of action films is action cinema is. I think we could do like the bar the barriers that need to be broken is gay and trans representation. There, like Louis Leterrier has commented that he perceive his perspective on the transporter on the character of the transporter in those films. It was transporter as a particularly when it came up in interviews for transport for transporter two was. Oh, that the transporter is a gay man. Uh, but, like, the actor playing him isn't gay. And so... It, it puts us in that situation of the Eddie Redmayne play, who is not who is male and not trans, playing a trans character situation. Um, in that regard. And I, I, the barriers I'd like to see broken next and stay broken would be more gay representation and more trans representation. Um, actor in particular I'm thinking of, like, popped in my head, who's, um, Elliot Page. Uh, like Elliot Page had some action stuff in in Inception, not as but not as prominent as an action role as say, uh, also a little bit of action stuff in Is a Future Past, but he had not not as much as like the other members of the Inception cast, not as much as in particular Leo and Leonardo DiCaprio and Joseph Gordon-Levitt, or oh, certainly not Tom Har or Tom Hardy. And I like to stand like, but they so did, the, but he so did the competence for it. Um, and I'm not saying that oh, when person comes out of trans, you start casting like and a trans person comes out as trans, identifying as males. Or go oh, you start pigeonholing them into action movie roles. But like, I think Elliot. Elliot Page could do uh, some really good action movie stuff. Um, and I wouldn't mind seeing that. Um, other one that comes to mind is um, like that, that. That's a big one that immediately comes to mind right now. I also did, I did some, did some action motion capture stuff for, um, and Beyond Two Souls, but again, and that's not necessarily a full action movie. I haven't seen Umbrella Academy yet, so I don't know how much action stuff Elliot has in that movie. Oh well, um, but yeah, like that's the, the just thinking in terms of other things in film, where there are barriers that are remain that remain that need to be broken. That's the next step, I think, and of course, the barriers that previously have been broken for women need to stay unbroken. We backslid when it comes to women-led action movies. Uh, we've we've gone back and forth uh, 
gosh, the name of the actress is just completely escaping me right now. Um, he starred in Mr. Star um, Cynthia Rothrock. There we go. Uh, it took me a second, like, to remember, like, I can't believe I spaced Cynthia Rock, Rothrock. Um, and I apologize to her for that, but, like, Cynthia Rothrock is, like, had a substantial action movie career through the 80s and 90s, 80s and, and mid-90s. Actually, a little bit, much beyond that, I, like, I'd like to see more, I, like, like, Cynthia Rothrock broke some barriers, and then the barriers got fixed, and that's a problem. And then we had you know, Charlie Theron in three movies, a few movies, break some barriers. Got fixed. Not fixed is the wrong turn. And they got rebuilt. And now they've been bro um and now they've been broken again. And it feels more solid. It feels more firm. We've we've got, gotten for all the faults about Gina Carano being transphobic, and she's put in good acting work, and just like I would like to see, I like to keep seeing women doing action films, and. Being women being able to direct action films, we, um, it should Catherine Bigelow like when we come to, to action films directed by women, it shouldn't be Catherine Bigelow and then people having to do search, Google searches to look for more movies. So that's my thoughts there. And one other oh, one other quick note about the movie, and I saw it in IMAX. I didn't see it. I did not see it in Screen X. Um. The option was available. My local theater had it. I elected not to do it after doing some research to determine that Screen X was only used for some scenes and not all of them. Uh, Screen X is, for those unfam unfamiliar, it is a technique where you have, for the screen, you have like three screens, off, like two additional screens on your peripheral vision with additional footage being projected onto those. And from the research I did that not all scenes in the film were done in Screen X, so um, most of the film was conventional, and then for the screens that were done in Screen X, it was the additional footage would pop up on there. And I selected to watch it in IMAX 2D because I thought those screens or um, the transition would be jarring. Um, particularly since like, I'd watched Tenet on um, 4K uh, Blu-ray, uh, or 4K, and when going between the IMAX and non-IMAX scenes, it transitioned the aspect ratio and it was a little jarring for me at the time and I was concerned how this would pan out in watching a movie on the big screen in a theater um however I could be wrong it could actually be like more immersive so I am in, if you watched Black Widow and Screen X hit it up hit me up in the comments I want to know or if you've seen movies in Screen X in general I'm interested to see how the technology works um both in terms of films that were entirely shot in, with Screen X in mind, or films that were partially shot in Screen X. Because I could also see, like, when I was a kid, my first exposure to IMAX was nature documentaries at the Oregon Museum of Science and History. And I could see similar things being done for Screen X cameras. And I'm in, in as well. So, I'm interested in hearing about that. <laughs>